Oh, hi everyone. Have you watched the drone fly on Mars yet? They did it in such a cool way. It's worth remembering that there is practically no atmosphere on Mars. That is why the conditions for flying drones there are really extreme. By the way, I'm wondering if there exist chemicals which don't belong on the Earth and can only exist on other planets, for instance, such as Mars or Mercury. Let's find out. Remember when I told you about The Brilliant, a website that helps you to develop your logic and thinking process. Since then, I myself have been using it and killing time profitably every day. Well, for those who hear this for the first time, let me explain. Brilliant is an educational platform where you can find over 60 interactive courses in mathematics, computer and natural sciences. This is a great opportunity to improve your skills in these disciplines while preparing for entering the university or training for different academic competitions and tests. The main advantage of this site is the studying format. Everything is explained visually, with animated examples and various tools, so you will not only solve a bunch of similar problems, but delve into the very essence of them, which in the future will help you to solve even more complex and interesting problems. This is a great approach for studying any subject. I'll leave the link in the description box, so you can check it out yourself and develop your skills. I think many of you have noticed that in nature there are almost no chemicals which are very chemically active. For instance, stones can lie around for thousands of years without changing, sand is not soluble in water and the atmosphere only slightly facilitates the burning of natural polymers, such as cellulose, which by the way is a main component of the composition of trees. In other words, we don't observe any explosions, self-ignitions or other chemical abnormalities in nature. All substances on Earth are in an energy equilibrium in relation to each other. However, thanks to additional energy, the modern chemical industry has learned to shift this balance, having obtained many chemicals which can't exist long under normal conditions on our planet. I know it sounds quite abstract. Let us better take a look at these very chemicals. For instance, if we place this iron cube on the stone and leave it there for, for example, 1000 years, it will eventually turn into such a red powder, which is iron oxide. Whereas, during this period of time, the stone won't change at all. The same is true about other metals as well. Almost all of them exist in the form of oxides or as a part of various minerals in the Earth's crust. Only four of them can be encountered in their pure form, but not very often. It takes a lot of energy to obtain other metals, to return several electrons to oxidized metals and turn them from seemingly regular stones into shiny firm metals. The column of alkali metals, which are called this way for reason, are especially energy consuming to obtain and highly unstable metals under normal conditions. They are called this way because upon reacting with water, they form a caustic alkali. You can observe this process watching how a piece of sodium reacts with water. Besides the alkali, the reaction also produces such a flammable gas as hydrogen. The reaction produces so much energy, that when big chunks of sodium react with water, they can self-ignite and even explode. Does it mean that if such an active metal as sodium reacts with water, it shifts the energy balance back and the obtained sodium hydroxide and also hydrogen turn into stable chemicals? Hmm, no really. Because sodium is such an active metal, even when it interacts with water, the obtained chemicals are not that safe. I think you know that sodium hydroxide, also known as caustic soda, can react with clock in pipes, breaking down the biopolymers it contains. If you accidentally spill this chemical on your moist skin, in a couple of seconds you can get a chemical burn. By the way, this fact was well demonstrated in the Fight Club film. What is this? This is a chemical burn. Ah, ah, ah! I've heard more than you've ever been burned. 
I decided to repeat this experiment, but instead of my hand, I'm going to use something similar, which is a chicken thigh. First I'm splashing it with water, and then pouring some pure sodium hydroxide on it. At first, it seems like nothing is happening, however, at the moment, when the alkali contacts with the moist skin, it immediately starts reacting with the proteins and fats the skin tissue contains. It turns fats into soap, and the protein-rich layer of skin into some sludge consisting of leftover amino acids. That is why you need to be extra careful when working with this chemical. This reaction, however, isn't as dramatic as it was shown in the film I mentioned earlier. As if that wasn't enough, even if you accidentally spill this chemical on cotton clothes, for instance, and leave it there for a couple of hours, sodium hydroxide will absorb moisture from the air. It will also be slowly eating away the cellulose that cotton cloth is made of. If we try to remove this caustic alkali, we can also get into a chemical trap, because when sodium hydroxide dissolves in water, it produces a lot of heat. My thermometer in the jar with dissolved alkali was even going off the scale. According to the pyrometer's readings, the temperature rose above 60 degrees Celsius. That is why to rinse alkali off any surface, you need a larger volume of cold water. It's good that our atmosphere can easily neutralize this alkali, however, it does that quite slowly. If we spill this chemical and leave it exposed to the moist air, sodium hydroxide will absorb as much moisture from the air as possible, and then it will start reacting with carbon dioxide. In a couple of days, this dangerous chemical will turn into sodium carbonate, which is safer chemical and not as caustic. I am wondering if there exist even more caustic and unstable chemicals. There are such chemicals indeed. For instance, there is an alkali which forms when the most active metal on earth cesium reacts with water. If we take a look at chemical tables, we will see that its dissociation constant in solution is the highest. To put it simply, when cesium hydroxide dissolves in a solution, it produces the highest number of hydroxide anions, which determine how alkaline a solution is. According to the data given in the tables, cesium hydroxide is about 100 times stronger than sodium hydroxide. But still, after running analogous experiments with cesium hydroxide and a chicken tie, A close and dissolving this chemical in water, I did notice that this substance reactivity was significantly higher. What did differ through was that when cesium hydroxide was exposed to the air, it absorbed much more moisture from the air, and in a couple of hours, this chemical turned into a puddle. A day later, this caustic alkali turned into harmless cesium carbonate after reacting with carbon dioxide from the air. However, in my opinion, it was not that impressive. Hmm, I have just found out that there exist chemicals called superalkalis, and they react more actively. For my next experiments, I have ordered quite rare and under normal conditions quite unstable chemicals. First. Such substance is sodium hydride, which is a compound of explosive sodium metal with a very flammable gas, which is hydrogen. When exposed to the air, under the influence of water vapor, this chemical immediately starts to break down into sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. But for now, the process seems slow. Let's imagine it has suddenly started to rain. On first contact of sodium hydride with water, so much heat is released that this white powder ignites. After that, it starts to break down into drops of caustic metallic sodium and such a flammable gas as hydrogen. I think it goes without saying that it's dangerous to handle such chemicals. If I keep splashing it with water, sodium will start reacting with it again turning into sodium hydroxide, which is that same very caustic alkali. It turned out that this reaction seriously affected the glass. Just look at these stains on the black plate. It means that such chemicals as superalkalis 
can self-ignite in the presence of water and even destroy everything around. That is why the sticker on the container says that this chemical should be handled without being exposed to the air. But if we continue to ignore all the safety precautions of handling sodium hydride, you can accidentally forget to put on gloves in the laboratory and spill this chemical on your wet hand. As we can see, it wouldn't result in anything good. The chicken thing imitating human skin will fare badly, because the sodium hydroxide and hydrogen produced as a result of the reaction between sodium hydride and water have left nasty burns on the skin. There is even more, sodium hydride is so reactive that even a small amount of these chemicals spilled on sweaty clothes can do some serious damage. That is why I am handling this chemical wearing all the necessary protective gear and under a powerful fume hood. But if you handle this chemical properly, sodium hydride can be used as an excellent reducing agent in the chemical synthesis and also as a proton acceptor. By the way, in chemistry the word super and super alkalize signifies how well an alkali can attract a proton, which is a hydrogen ion rather than how caustic an alkali is. Nevertheless, some superalkalis are also highly dangerous to handle. In reality true, sodium hydride is relatively mild when compared to more caustic and hazardous chemicals, such as terbutyl lithium, which has recently earned a rather bad reputation. Just like sodium hydride, this chemical is sold in tin cans with thick insulation. At first, there seems to be nothing remarkable about this bottle with solution. Strange things started happening when I opened the can. Hmm, what is it? And how I am supposed to get the liquid out? It turned out that just like sodium hydride, terbutyl lithium really doesn't like to be in our atmosphere. That is why this liquid needs to be drawn with a syringe and with a supply of an inert gas. To do that, first, I am filling a balloon with such an inert gas as argon and I am inserting the syringe inside the balloon. After that, to start supplying gas, I am piercing the protective membrane in the lid, which helps to seal the connection. Using another syringe, now I can draw some liquid from the bottle. This process needs to be done very carefully and it is important not to tilt the syringe. If you accidentally do that, exposing the content to the ear, as soon as a drop of terbutyl lithium solution gets on the tip of the syringe needle, it will immediately ignite, setting on fire the rest of the accidentally spilled reagent. This is why it is so dangerous to work with terbutyl lithium, because there can easily break out a fire in the laboratory. What makes it even more dangerous is that usually terbutyl lithium is sold in the form of solution mixed with flammable chemicals such as hexane or pentane. This is the only way to safely transport this chemical. When terbutyl lithium gets spilled on the skin, it immediately reacts with moisture on the skin, thus creating butane and lithium hydroxide. At least it doesn't self-ignite. However, the lithium hydroxide formed on the skin is a fairly strong alkali, that is why it can easily leave a chemical burn. Still, if you get distracted just for a couple of seconds and leave a drop of this chemical on the tip of your syringe needle, all the spilled terbutyl lithium will ignite, setting on fire the evaporating solvent. When it gets spilled on clothes, this chemical can even burn holes in cotton fabric, because in a matter of seconds, this superalkali turns cellulose molecules into a mix of charred organic molecules and carbon. Also, if you spill this chemical on objects with low thermal conductivity, terbutyl lithium will also easily self-ignite. And that's not surprising, because this substance is 10 billion times stronger alkali than sodium hydroxide. Although on reacting with water, 
It breaks down into such a flammable gas as butane and lithium hydroxide, which is quite soluble in water. That is why these chemicals' properties manifest themselves quite obviously only when it's not exposed to moisture on air. By the way, do you remember I said earlier that this chemical has earned a rather bad reputation? In 2008, terbutolitum became a cause of a highly tragic accident in the University of California when a student named Sherry Sanji died as a result of this chemical's self-ignition. According to mass media reports, when she was drawing terbutolitum from a big container, the syringe she was using came apart and the spilled chemical immediately self-ignited, setting on fire other nearby flammable solvents. I think you can see that even when this chemical is in a syringe, it can leak out of the relatively white needle, thus turning a regular syringe into a real flamethrower with lithium ion dyed flames. Besides, in the case I have just mentioned, the student didn't wear a lab coat, which is why her fleece sweater immediately caught fire. This is why you should always wear a laboratory coat, glasses and various gloves, depending on what chemicals you work with in the laboratory. I purposely spilled several milliliters of terbutalitum solution on the table with aluminum sheets in order to show you how flammable this chemical can be. Nevertheless, in spite of being so dangerous, Terbutolitum is still frequently used as a metal organic acceptor of protons in organic synthesis, and of course this chemical is handled only in an inert atmosphere. For instance, all containers for solutions are first blown with such an inert gas as argon, and the gas inside test tube is constantly dried in order for terbutolitum not to break down and interfere with chemical reactions. That is why, basically, it's extremely difficult to work with superalkalis in our planet, because of how highly treacherously our atmosphere reacts with such chemicals. But it will be much safer to work with terbutolitum on Mars, because there is practically no oxygen in its atmosphere. So, I think, after watching this video, you'll know more about such chemicals as superalkali and their properties. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.